distinguished academicians, industry experts, researchers, faculties of different colleges from India and abroad, faculty of Sambhasa's family, and our very dear students. The Department of Economics and Department of Banking and Finance takes immense pleasure in welcoming you to the Professor V. M. Dandekar Memorial Series 2021-22. This year, we are proud to host the international webinar on transitions to greener economy and finance, marching towards sustainable livelihood. Symbiosis, as an institution, offers to its students and faculty a vibrant learning ecosystem designed around its multicultural and innovative ethos based on the principles of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, where the world is one family. Our college has always strived to create an intellectually stimulant environment and provides numerous opportunities to enhance and broaden the thinking abilities. This webinar enables us to rekindle our thoughts and our duties towards a better world and towards sustainability. Dr. Nilofa Rena, Head Department of Banking, and myself, Dr. Sheena Matthews, Head Department of Economics, take pride in the fact that we have a team of a very competent, collaborative, vibrant teachers in the departments. Our team of faculty would be interacting with you through the different sessions of the webinar. In the year 2008, the Departments of Economics and Banking had taken the initiative of organizing various seminars, conferences, symposiums, and lectures in the memory of one of the most renowned and distinguished economists of all time, the late Professor V. M. Dandekar. As a tribute to Professor Dandekar, the Departments of Economics and Banking thought of collaborating with the best minds in the field, and they have put forth their thoughts in the book titled Changing Dynamics of the Indian Economy, The Decade of 2010s and Ahead. This book attempts to deliberate and discuss pertinent issues concerning the socio-political and economic dimensions of the economy. The book consists of eight sections, and each of these sections deals with various diverse macroeconomic issues relating to the various sectors of our economy. The book consists of a compilation of different opinions, insights, suggestions, and recommendations from distinguished academicians, industry experts, and researchers. We are proud that many of the authors have joined us for the release of the book. This book wouldn't have been possible without the constant guidance of our principal, Dr. Soman, our former department heads, Dr. Sunani Parchuri and Dr. Marcel Samuel, who have contributed on making of the book and constantly guided us. To release the book, may I call upon our principal, Dr. Rishikesh Soman, who has always been a pillar of support. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sheena. Good morning to all. Welcome to this webinar. I'm very happy that- uh, oh, Sir, uh, even, so you're sorry. not audible, sir. Oh, my, oh, my... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's fine. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning and uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, after after uh, this you know entire pandemic we were really worried whether we will be able to conduct this thing or no or in fact we were planning to conduct it uh, physically in the auditorium but unfortunately we have to still meet uh, online i welcome all the authors all the dignitaries for this webinar i must congratulate my team my my uh, you know, my uh, earlier vice principal, Dr. Sunene Pudri, who had to be, uh, who, who had been uh, the department head of economics, uh, Dr. Marcel Samuel, who was uh, head department of banking, and the present uh, head department of economics, Dr. Sheena, uh, present head department of banking, Dr. Nilu, or Nilo for Raina, I'm sorry, uh, I have to be a little formal there. And uh, 
my other colleagues from the department uh, for for uh, completing this particular task of having this book release uh, we they have they have been after this uh, entire book publication for quite some time and i must thank all the authors for their cooperation their patience and their their support for this particular endeavor i am really happy that the book has really come out well as far as the contents are concerned and uh, i am very happy to release this particular book and i wish uh, you know that uh, i i think uh, you know that everybody would appreciate the efforts uh, done by our uh, department of economics and banking uh, in uh, in the in the form of this particular book so i hereby declare that the book is being released thank you very much Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for being huge pillar of support and encouraging us in all our endeavors. Good morning, friends. I'm Professor Nilo Farana, Head Department of Banking. I'm here to give you a brief overview about the webinar. India is at the cusp of two significant transformation. The first is its economic transformation. The second is its green transformation. India's green transformation is an attractive, vital and mandatory component of its overall economic transformation. Green economy strategies are needed to promote sustainable growth and to break the pattern of environmental degradation and natural resource depletion. Emission reductions can be achieved with minimal cost to GDP. The transition to green and inclusive economies has been long deliberated both at the national and global level. India has recently made two major global commitments, the 2030 Global Development Agenda and the ratification of Paris Agreement, which aims for holistic well-being of all today and in the future without surpassing the natural boundary limits of environment. Greener economy is required to sustain the well-being of all of us across the globe. It would help in providing a safety net for future generations to have a better life. Green finance is central to the overall dimension on sustainability of economic growth. Rapid economic development is often achieved at the cost of environment. So the need of the R is to increase the allocation of funds towards setting up and, and adopt environmentally sustainable projects. So friends, our webinar aims to deliberate on needs, issue, challenges, opportunities, and public policy interventions concerning transitions to greener economy and greener finance in India and the world. This was a brief overview, friends. Now we move on for our sessions. The first speaker, and I take this immense opportunity that the first speaker is our alumnus, our very own alumnus, Mr. Yogesh Mittal, a graduate from the Pune University Symbiosis College and an Indian Chartered Accountant. In a career spanning more than a decade, Mr. Mittal has worked with organizations like PwC and KPMG from consulting side in India, where he was an advisor to several international clients on business and tax subjects. Mr. Mittal held key leadership roles in finance verticals in companies such as Indigo Airlines, Renew Power from the industry side. He majors in taxation profile and currently is a CFO and lead strategy for JBM's environment business projects. His skills and exposure include integrated reporting, tax appellate, international business, strategic collaborations such as joint ventures, investment and transaction structuring. Yogesh is a regular speaker in various forums and he shares his experiences across the globe. Welcome Yogesh, back to your alma mater. Yogesh, now the stage is all yours. He'll be speaking on transitions to greener economy and finance. So we welcome Yogesh. Over to you, sir. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Nilofar ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you to the entire department and uh, my alma mater, uh, the Symbiosis College. And the best part of the life was really there and I owe every bit of my success to my college and uh, all my beloved teachers. It's fantastic to be here. Thanks for the opportunity of uh, being able to share some um, thoughts with, uh, with the listeners, with the dear friends, uh, with the fellow colleagues about, uh, uh, you know, the, the transitions of uh, India uh, into the green economy. And uh, as a developing uh, economy, some of the concepts which we see, uh, you know, and uh, the moment in which we are in right now, obviously uh, uh, makes us, uh, you know, uh, think about our roadmap, our strategies in a more detailed manner and uh, see to it that uh, we are able to not only develop ourselves properly, but we are able to develop ourselves in a more sustainable manner, keeping the impact of carbon emissions uh, and uh, environment, which is a nat natural corollary with, uh, with industrialization uh, and keeping that impact minimal. So uh, in the subsequent slides, I'll be just discussing about uh, the green economy, the aspects of green finance, and at what stage is India in with these concepts and how the transition is happening, and obviously uh, representing the renewable and uh, green energy companies in the industry that I represent from, so taking a clue from my practical experiences uh, also. Is my screen visible, Nilo Ferman? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Great. Thanks, sir. So green economy. So what actually is a green economy, sir? It's a system framework. It's a framework of several economic activities which are taking place in which you have low carbon emissions, more resource efficiency and more amount of social inclusiveness. So does it mean that the existing economic framework is not having these elements? No. Every economy in the world, every framework, every system have these aspects. But over a period, the impact of industrialization, the carbon emissions and all the aspects put together tend to create some significant amount of impact on the system, on the economy, on the environment surrounding that framework. And a green economy is basically adjusting yourself in a day in a way that you are able to conduct your activities by keeping it low carbon uh, emission, uh, highly efficiency in terms of its resources and having more amount of social inclusiveness. So uh, keeping a focus on the investments, employment and skills, and uh, it's, it's a framework which is driven by the public and private investments in a way which allows reduced carbon emissions and simple parlance, reduced pollution, uh, enhanced energy and resource efficiency and prevention of loss of biodiversity and economic systems. So to put it simply for the listeners and the people, um, energy, the electricity with which we are running our computers, the lights in our rooms, the telephones and everything around us, if that energy is going to be produced by burning the coal and causing a tremendous amount of air and water pollution, that could be a way. However, if the same amount of power can be generated by use of sun, by use of wind, by use of water and other renewable energy, then not only are we saving the conventional power and resources with us, we'll also be able to cause lesser amount of damage to the air and water and cause lesser amount of pollution and bring lesser problems to us. So this in very simplistic terms uh, are uh, the means and substance of a green economy. How is it enabled? And when our economy is in a transition phase, like India and many other countries, including China, has been in a transition phase. We are developing. We are our industries, our businesses are expanding, are, are developing right now. Then how is the transition enabled from a, uh, uh, towards a green economy? It is enabled through a variety of measures, such as targeted public infrastructure uh, expenditure policy reforms, changes in taxation and regulation. To give you an example, if you burn a coal, there is something called as clean energy cess, which is levied by the central government to you. And 
on contrary to that you, when you're putting up a solar or a wind power project the government is going to provide you certain incentives in the tax and other things so this is a way to penalize the energy resources the energy producers which are using the conventional form of power and using those resources to incentivize the green energy and those forms of uh, uh, businesses which are less carbon emittent which are less pollution bearing so this is a way in which the transition towards green economy is enabled moving further i don't know what happened with the screen moving further to uh, the india story here's a look at uh, the the renewable energy industry in india it pre predominantly it comprises of hydro energy and other forms of renewable power and within those other forms of renewable power we see the small hydro projects we see wind power we see solar power and we see biopower now biopower is something which is a very catchy word right now we've seen solar wind hydro being discussed in our textbooks and newspapers everywhere around us to a fairly large extent but biopower is something which is picking up a lot of interest and attraction uh, in the recent times now biomass power is basically the power which you generate by using animal waste by using the urban waste industrial waste so the beautiful mountains of garbage that we are creating in our cities every city or maybe outside the uh, outside every city a usage of that waste be it the animal waste be it the uh, chicken litter or any other form of uh, uh, waste the household waste from the universities from our houses from offices colleges everywhere the industrial waste which you know in the form of uh, either in the form of sludge or the liquid waste we call it or solid waste or whatever usage of that waste to convert power and managing it scientifically to remove reduce its carbon emissions so biopower is basically that sort of power now apart from the solar wind hydro bio all the kind of power generation that we've seen a major cause of pollution in uh, anywhere for that matter including india is our vehicles so as long as you're going to have the diesel and petrol vehicles and uh, after a certain uh, uh, phase we transited to you know uh, moving towards uh, cng vehicles which were less pollution bearing and now we are moving towards electric vehicles in a big way so the electric scooters electric scooters electric bikes electric buses electric trucks cars all of those that you see is an emerging concept and as compared to rest of the world this is a, a recently introduced concept in the indian economy in the indian industry in the indian society and we are moving towards it in a big way so what does the renewable energy stats tell us how well have we done what where have we reached till now the overall impact of the renewable energy in india today has crossed the installed capacity has crossed 100 gigawatts and if you look at in the last 5 years the growth pattern suggests a compounded annual growth rate of 15% so india has done phenomenally well as far as its expansion and transition to renewable energy is concerned the last 5 years we see the entire country the entire industry the entire ecosystem has moved significantly towards solar wind and other forms of renewable power installations the government policies the industry practices every individual is probably in the process of either aligning or has already aligned in this transition forum the result of this crossover of 100 gigawatts of installed capacity renewable energy in india um so this i'm um, not able to use a pointer sorry i'll just use a pointer the prime minister ms modi has initially set installation of 175 gigawatt of power by 2030 but looking at the current performance it has increased to 450 gigawatts in the next 8 years so india is going to become from 100 to 450 more than four and a half times india is going to grow in its renewable energy installations in the next 8 years so you can see 
the amount of growth, the amount of expansion, the explosive growth this sector is going to hold. And not only that, it's just uh, an expectation, the past five year program and the performance of the whole country reflects that it is doable and it will happen. So one can imagine the gravity of this uh, transition with the, in which it is going to happen. Now, out of this renewable energy, a significant amount of spar, 46% of the total energy is coming from solar. Wind constitutes around 40% and solar has taken over wind recently. The biopower is just around 10.5% and small hydro are less than 5%. So this is how the composition of the entire renewable energy installation is happening. Along with setting of the targets, forming policies, aligning industry, encouraging businesses, encouraging consumers, creating awareness in society and all of these measures, there are several other strategic policy level regulatory measures which are being taken and all of those put together um, are going to link towards an expansion of four and a half times in our renewable energy uh, installations in the next eight years. Now I'll move to biopower in a more detailed way because uh, the solar and wind are uh, fairly known subjects, but biopower is something which is uh, really picking up. Um, my screen reflects right now uh, on the left hand side the images of landfill sites. These sites are nothing but they are the barren piece of land generally somewhere outside the city, outside Pune, outside Delhi, outside Mumbai, everywhere outside where the entire city waste is being taken up in trucks and highways and vehicles and they're just being dumped there. Now once they've been dumped there, the next day further waste comes and it's being dumped there. And then this process continues for days, weeks, months, years. And as a result of it, we have these beautiful mountains of waste which are being created. And uh, this is not only privy to India. This is happening everywhere in the world, especially in the Asian and uh, the developing economies. and. Uh, and uh, this happened in the past with Europe and most other uh, countries as well. But the reality is that in 2022, this uh, garbage mountain of landfill is becoming increasingly the biggest problem of India. Not only that it takes away a lot of land resource and just leaving the waste in that manner causes a tremendous amount of emissions in the air and reduces the quality of our air pollution. A uh, global map of estimated PM2 exposure by country, India and Beijing, India and uh, China are currently in the red situation. There are uh, news, I am uh, based in the Delhi city and every day we realize that uh, the Delhi's population and uh, many other cities' population is absolutely not worth living for and uh, clearly a result of that. Uh, the world's most polluted, you can see the Guru Gram, which is Gurgaon and Jewish cities are joining New Delhi, Ghaziabad. Uh, a city in Faisalabad, again Faridabad, Bhivadi, again an industrial town adjoining Delhi, Noida, Patna, uh, a city called Hutan in China and balance two cities in India and uh, Pakistan. So this whole region of Asia, the subcontinent as we call it, is full of uh, cities which are having the tremendous amount of air and uh, other kind of population, other kind of pollutions here. Uh, on the extreme right hand side, these are the cities of the beautiful Yamuna River. The white color material is actually not the snow. These are the emissions of chemicals and uh, pollutants which are existing in the river. So as we are on our way to become a US 5 trillion economy and very soon we'll be crossing this remark, I'm sure with a kind of uh, with the kind of uh, variables and factors and strengths and everything that we have. But in our moving towards five trillion economy these are the marks which we are going to uh, which we are going to you know put across uh, as a path behind us for the generations to come and this exactly is the idea for moving towards a green economy that not to reduce the speed of your economic development you are on your way to become a five trillion economy yes you will become a five trillion economy but adjust yourself in a way that you cause lesser damage to, uh, to the environment, you conduct businesses which are more sustainable, the social environment and all the other impacts of your business and activities are such that you are able to do the things in a longer term in a, in a better manner. So uh, therefore the need of moving towards uh, 
the green economy and uh, uh, so this is a look on uh, the waste management scenario as per this government uh, information uh, the municipal solid generation the municipal solid waste generation this is uh, the waste of every household market uh, every possible uh, place which is municipal and solid so india produces around 62 million tons every year it's a huge amount of waste that the whole country generates in 365 days a year and 70% of them is collected out of that 70%, 50% is taken to landfill and 20% out of those is currently treated. The balance 30%, where it goes, nobody even has a clue. So out of the entire generation, 50% is being dumped into the dump site and 20% of that is somewhere treated. The balance 30% is nowhere to be seen. The current power generation from this 62 million tons right now is 500 megawatts and India produces only 50 megawatts out of it. Only one tenth of this capacity is being utilized as of now. So clearly we have a very long way to go as far as this is concerned. And this is a ready resource available to us. The MSW generation by 2031, and as India would have crossed very handsomely a five trillion economy mark, the 62 million ton is going to enhance by two and a half times in the next eight years. And if this is the amount of waste that we are going to generate, and if we leave it untreated the way we've been doing right now, every city actually will be surrounded by beautiful mountains of waste and causing a tremendous amount of damage to our atmosphere and environment around us. Let's be ready for that if we don't move towards green economy, green initiatives, and if we are not going to participate strictly and seriously into it. We need another 1,200 hectares of land every year for this amount of waste, which is uh, going to surround us everywhere. Uh, there is a program of Swachh Bharat Mission. We remember, uh, at least some of us can remember, the broom being uh, held by our uh, Honorable Prime Minister uh, one of those years, five, six years back, and he himself was uh, uh, was uh, you know sorting the waste outside his office and all of that. Not only that, uh, just for a picture thing, uh, you know, the government has uh, taken up uh, a few initiatives. Swachh Bharat Mission, it was launched in 2014 and with a target of uh, USD 9 billion in waste management initiatives and a significant amount of this money is not yet spent. It is aligned uh, with the government and they are waiting for more entrepreneurs amongst us to come over, to come further and take up these projects. And very clearly, whenever there is an adversity, there is an opportunity. So what is the opportunity for us? These are some of the some of the examples of how people are managing and trying to derive value out of the waste which is lying all over around us. Uh, the names are not important, but a company like this, they recycle industrial and consumer waste into useful products. They basically manufacture handmade products like handbags from old gunny bags. So old gunny bags and all the waste material that would lie somewhere, this company picks all of that and makes handbags out of it. A company like this, they basically take up the waste from the dump site and they make organic compost with it. Now, most of us living in the metro cities understand that when we have the organic fertilizer, it is very often being used even as a gift item in our birthday parties and so many other social occasions. And companies like these, are actually going and picking up the waste which is lying right outside your building and making organic fertilizer out of it and they would sell it back to you for 3,000, 4,000 rupees. If you want to order organic fertilizer on uh, on Amazon or those kind of websites, it costs you three to 4,000 rupees a ton. And that is actually and incidentally coming from the waste which is lying outside, untreated, unnoticed, outside our premises. So the moment somebody takes a little notice of that and try to make some useful out of that, it is being able to, uh, you know, make a very beautiful business model out of that. Blue Cat Paper, again, uh, similar to other companies, uh, they've been uh, collecting a lot of agro industrial waste like cotton rags and rice towel and so many other things and make paper out of it. And uh, my company and uh, so many other industrial players have developed plants for waste to energy. 
we follow a process called as incineration in which the waste which we have uh, from our households, from communities, from market areas, from universities, that all's being, this whole waste is being burned. And the scientific name of this process is called as incineration, where uh, certain hundreds and thousand uh, uh, tons of waste is burnt every day and the heat which it produces, that heat is used to uh, run the turbine basically and there it leads to generation of electricity. So the waste which would otherwise just lie unattended, untreated and it would cause so much of problems not only for land pollution, water pollution, air pollution. We use that waste, we convert that waste into power and we supply that power back to the society. It goes back into the schools, into the hospitals, into colleges, and that power is actually being used for the upliftment of the society. The society again produces the waste and send it to us. And again, that waste basically is converted into power and supplied back in the form of power to society. So a complete uh, recycling uh, uh, project, uh, as we call it, but uh, we make energy, we make power from there. A quick look at the green finance. Now we've seen a green economy. A green economy is a system which is socially inclusive, creates lesser impact of carbon emissions and uh, you know pollution, and it is uh, more resource oriented. Now, what is a green finance? Now, green finance is any finance activity. It can be a product, it can be a service, which is created to ensure a better environment. Now, it's very technical in simple words. Basically, the loans, equity investments, finance, money which is used to encourage the development of green projects or minimize the impact on the climate of regular projects or both. So if there is a project which results in better uh, utilization of resources, causing less damage to uh, environment and uh, uh, sustainability, you finance that kind of a project, it becomes green finance. Also, there is a project which is essential, but it is causing a tremendous amount of pollution and damage to the environment's and sustainability. And money is used to minimize the impact of such a project on the environment and sustainability. Both of them, the money provided to this kind of a project or that kind of project is called as green finance. So what does it cover? It covers renewable energy projects, the solar, wind, waste management, the pollution prevention and control, biodiversity conservation, circular economy initiatives, sustainable use of natural resources and land. So any of the finance, any money which has been put into these kind of projects is called as green finance. We've seen that it's a part of product and services and it can be through banking, it can be through insurance, it can be through investments. And there are several examples of this, which we see regularly in our uh, daily lives. Could be green green bond issuance, green tagged loans, investment funds, climate risk insurance, and many other instruments are used to basically deploy green finance and uh, have the green finance uh, you know available in uh, in uh, different uh, situations. A look at country by country. Uh, this image may not be so clear, but let me explain. Uh, United States, China, and France. They've been the countries that has maximum been availing green finance through green bonds and uh, multiple such uh, usages all over uh, the world. And India is somewhere in the 15th spot. So we are uh, making progress in the areas of raising green finance, bringing more green funds, bank loans to our countries and doing those projects. But clearly, we, we still have a long way to go. However, we are uh, not so behind uh, the rest of the world. Yes, uh, as compared to Europe and America and uh, even China, uh, there is uh, a significant amount of work which still uh, all of us need to do together. Uh, sitting in 2022, uh, is it really a time for a paradigm shift? We still have a few years we still have a generation, we still have few more years of, uh, of uh, pollution causing and staying comfortable in our comfort zones and not doing anything about it, or has the time come really? Uh, it's, it's a clear reflection that, you know, there was, a, there was a disease called as Beijing cough. So the people who are living in Beijing, in the capital city of China, they were having a certain cold, uh, having a certain cough, and this was pre-COVID. 
uh, nothing to do with COVID and all. This is uh, because of the pollution. And uh, Beijing and New Delhi, like two world's greatest developing economies and the capital cities of Delhi and China, they had a tremendous amount of pollution, so much that uh, uh, you know they developed a disease which was specifically only for the people who are living in that area. And uh, I may just be digressing, but a very interesting story is that um, it was told that uh, you know from the space, the Great Wall of China is the only thing in the Earth which is visible. So one astronaut went to the space and he, when he looked at China to find out where the green, is, is it true that he, he can see the Great Wall of China? He didn't see the Great Wall of China, but there were pollution all over, all over China that he could see. So the developing economies are bound to create it. The only thing is taking systematic time and effort, they have reduced it to a large extent. And imagine going, growing up to a situation of having a disease by that name, by the name of that city, and reducing it completely 360 degrees. This is the effort which actually is required in your transition towards a green economy. The River Thames, it's, uh, it's flowing in the middle of London, and it was filthy, full smelling drain till a certain number of years back. And from there, it's been converted to one of the world's cleanest river. This is yet again an example of a transition towards a green economy that I will continue to grow, that we will continue to prosper, will continue to become the world power, we will become number one in the world one day. But my resources, the nature, the environment, the surroundings around us, that I will not let damage. And I will leave it for my younger generations, for the future generations. That is the thing which really is a simple substance of green transition. Uh, not taking the examples of uh, Beijing and London anymore. Indore, our own city, and I'm sure a lot of us uh, may be familiar with the city and uh, maybe from there. 72 countries in the world are studying the model of Indore. For years, Indore has been acclaimed as India's best and cleanest city. And so much so, the 72 countries are studying the impact, the model which Indore has employed. It has its own repercussions, but look at uh, the, the strength of this model that countries all over the world are studying, are coming to Indore to study what, what waste management and how clean they are. And this actually is a clear replica, clear uh, example of how a green economy and a green city should work. So these are clearly the examples where not only people are thinking about transitions and moving towards green economy, but they have actually implemented a lot of those. So it clearly calls for a focus and conviction, both in government, administration, society, and each individual amongst us. The legal framework and policies to enable and govern this, and some number of incentives and encouragement. Uh, so with this, uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, for uh, listening to me and uh, allowing me to share some of my thoughts. I hope uh, I'm able to convey my message to you and uh, thanks for uh, the opportunity once again. I'd love to hear back uh, your thoughts and ideas. About it. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Vidhi Kalra and I'm working as an assistant professor in the economics and banking department at Symbiosis College of Arts and Commerce. Firstly, a very big thank you to you, Yogesh, sir, for that really enriching session and for enlightening our participants with so much knowledge. I'm sure we all have enjoyed listening to him just as how much he enjoyed conveying this session to us. So we would have the Q&A session with you in a while. Moving ahead to our next esteemed guest today's webinar, Mr. Yuki Yoshida, who is an environmental attache in the Embassy of Japan, New Delhi. Yoko so sir, which means welcome sir in Jap Japanese. Well, we are indeed fortunate enough to have such a speaker like him with us today. Talking a little about Yoshida sir, well, sir is a graduate from the Chuo University in Japan and is the second secretary environmental attache in the Embassy of Japan, New Delhi. He is responsible for conducting various surveys and analysis of environmental issues such as air pollution, water pollution, solid waste management and climate change in India, including spreading network between Japan and India in the environmental field. 
Earlier, he has worked in disaster waste management and administrative division in the Ministry of Environment in Japan. He has a career of environmental affairs in ministry spanning over 15 years. He has contributed towards friendly ties between India and Japan for sustainable and environmentally friendly development through people to people interaction. We are indeed grateful to you, sir, for sparing your valuable time for us. Over to you, sir. Sir, could you please unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Perfectly. Okay. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So, distinguished guests and uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning or good afternoon. So, it is indeed my great pleasure to be here today. And I feel honored to be given the opportunity to present uh, Japanese experience in international webinar on tradition to greener economy and finance, marching towards sustainable livelihood organized by Department of Economics, Department of Banking and, and Finance, Symbiosis College of Art and Commerce. Uh, I think uh, this kind of meeting uh, webinar is important because uh, it provides an opportunity to recognize how Japanese experts will be able to utilize for environmental narratives in India and also uh, all over the world. So I would like to share my presentation all about uh, Can you see this right? Not yet, sir. Could you just open the PowerPoint presentation? I can see the folder itself. So I have already uh, opened my slide. Mm. Uh, so we can't see it um, as of now. Mm -hmm. I would request you to just reopen it. OK. Sir, I request you to present your whole screen rather than the window. Uh, it'll be yes, sir. Perfect. We can see it now. Okay. Oh, you yeah. can go ahead, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, today I will talk about three topics, and uh, number one is Japanese experience, and uh, number two similarity and uh, effort by Japanese government to India, and uh, finally uh, future perspectives for sustainable development in India. So uh, let me begin. Uh, number one is uh, Japanese experience. Uh, as you may know, Japan is uh, recently well known as one of the most advanced developed country in the world. But the way to development was so long and was facing some burdens for getting a better quality of life. I mean the uh, air quality and the water quality. And <clears throat> in the 1950 to 60, so roughly about uh, 60 or 70 years ago, to recover from the leverage of the World War II, Japan made slides in economic and industrial growth with the environmental deteriorate. Uh, Japan could last to recover industries from the devastating situation, but the uh, environmental insight was left behind of development. So you can see the uh, light <coughs> picture of that waste dump site. So Japan experienced heavy pollution caused disease. Serious disease occurred due to cadmium or mercury uh, contained in wastewater from industrial factory in Japan. 
So in 1960s, one of the most terrible diseases was Minamata disease, uh, as you may know. Uh, its symptoms include so much pain and numbness in the hand and the feet, general muscle weakness, loss of peripheral vision, and damage to hearing and speech. In extremely case, deaths follow within weeks of the onset of symptoms. And also air pollution was uh, serious in Japan. Uh, smoke from factories polluted the air in the city. People living in the area suffered from serious diseases. Uh, we called Yokkaichi asthma. Yokkaichi is a uh, uh, location name in the in the near Osaka. Uh, Osaka. In the most serious air pollution caused diseases, uh, the burning of petroleum and crude oil generated large quantities of sulfur oxide. A smog began to cover some quarters of the cities, resulting in severe cases of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, you can see that picture. For tackling these diseases, uh, in a series of cost collecting measures in 1968 uh, air pollution control law, <coughs> the government of Japan introduced the base clause of pollution control. And in 1970s, the government passed 40 more bills to cope with the pollution. Uh, these kind of regulation were enacted by government to ensure strict enforcement. After that, some of the countermeasure regulation were established by the union and local government, like uh, you can see automobile uh, NOx and the PM law and the Waste Management Act, uh, something like that. And the uh, Japanese government played an important role to reduce air and water pollution. However, this recovery was brought about not only union government, but also by the cooperation with local government. The basic concept is Japan as well as uh, in India are uh, well known in the world as polluter pay principle. Uh, it can work so effective and uh, it is persuasive for citizens. And moreover, as you may know, Japanese companies helped in providing balanced technology for abatement of pollution. Uh, both government and the private sector have started the journey for more greener and sustainable future with holding hands each other. A good example of it is automotive sectors. Japanese companies have released so many types of cars, uh, PHV, HV, EV, and FCV. Uh, India's pathway to decarbonization of automotive sector is going, going directly to EV with some CNG or bioethanol vehicle stuck on it. But Japanese companies developed more various choices on it, uh, how it contributes reduction of pollutants, showing affordable cost to consumer and the grade of environmental field rate. The collaboration between government and the private sector generated more synergy for better improvement and it led good circulation of economy. Company corresponded properly because we expensive, experienced severe pollution, as I said before. Uh, the catastrophic damage turned into mutual merit, both company and citizen and also the government. Uh, this is a uh, sorry, this is a little bit old survey, but you can see the Japanese citizens have mindfulness of environmental friendly activities. 
that the awareness of citizens are very essential part of the successful for the becoming clean and environmental friendly cities. Otherwise, uh, accurate recovery could has not happened. Uh, I'd like to show you uh, what the current Japanese environment. Uh, we took up the challenge to clean up our own mess. We had a mission and uh, here are the results. Firstly, the concentration of NOx and SOx, which are major pollutants, have been continually decreasing in Japan. Uh, you can see the, the, the the picture. Uh, SOx was the cause of one of the most horrible pollution-related diseases that I mentioned earlier, Yokajasma. But this disease does not occur anymore in Japan. So secondly, the concentration of PM10 and PM2.5 have, have also been continually decreasing in Japan. PM is the most serious air pollutant in India also. And uh, it would be of interest to the health of all Indians to reduce its level. So this slide, uh, the concentration of PM in Tokyo is lower than other major big city in India. So you can see the lowest uh, line is the uh, Japanese uh, Tokyo concentration of the PM. This table shows Japanese outcome of tackling pollutants. So various efforts have created an environment as a beautiful international city. So the story of Japan has a happy ending after the struggle of so many years. So nowadays, uh, we would like to share our experience and lessons learned with uh, India. So besides, of course, uh, any other indicators like hygiene or proper waste management, uh, such kind of facilities were fully implemented and it keeps the city clean and comfortable. And the second part is similarity and effort by Japan to India. So uh, this is a recent data from website of CPCB, uh, Central Pollution Control Board in India, which shows uh, 2021 is better than 2020, but AQI is so high in comparison with the India standard. <clears throat> this is caused by some factors uh, such as stable burning, transportation emissions, uh, biomass burning from settlement, and uh, also emissions from industry, which cannot be handled properly. And uh, this is also a recent data from the website of CPCB. Uh, which shows almost a half of liver does not comply with the standard. You can see 47% of the liver. And uh, accordingly to Municipal Solid Waste Report 2018 to 19, uh, published by CPCB. Uh, well, roughly 1.5 lakh ton per day in 2018 to 2019. So roughly calculation of it for uh, for five for oh, sorry 5.4 clones. So oh, you get some mentioned the uh, six uh, 62 million ton. So ton per year, and uh, it highlighted waste processing and disposal facilities in ma majority of states are not in working condition and treated waste is only 37% of generated waste. Uh, it means 
further improvement will be required for all cities. So uh, this situation, uh, like past of Japan, uh, thus we can contribute to reducing air and water pollution and to managing municipal waste uh, to hunt together with uh, Indian people. Uh, in this context, uh, Japan has provided some kind of support, including financial and technical support under ODA. Japan is the largest donor for India, and we could make uh, uh, some metals, bridges, loaders, and also few technical cooperation in the field of agriculture, sanitation, and hygiene waste management and capacity building for Indian government in various sectors. I will show you some examples. Uh, this is a, a ITS system in Ahmedabad. It's a, a left side of the picture. And the right side is a, 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 I touch a point in, in previously, Delhi metals. And second slide is a uh, uh, water management project in Balanasi. Balanasi is so long river, but from middle point of it to end of sea is so deteriorated by human activities. And so we treat it for building some facilities. So sewage treatment plant and uh, rehabilitation of the existing switch treatment and uh, also community toilet. Uh, on waste management field, uh, Yachifo Engineering has dedicated India for ex exceeding 10 years. Uh, they installed sanitary landfill in the West Bengal nearby Kolkata and taught people how to segregate garbage between biodegradable waste and non-biodegradable waste, which these waste take forward to recycling, composting, and incinerating and uh, land, landing, I mean the landfill. Uh, and also, they taught uh, maximum, use, maximum use of resources and helpful for people to life to saving money and the environment, as well as to keep hygiene around their residence. And the uh, light picture is uh, Hitachi Zosen. Hitachi Zosen is uh, uh, Japan's uh, west uh, incineration companies for the waste. So Hitachi Zosen has installed their waste to energy plants, uh, which are useful to reduce the amount of waste and generate the electricity that is currently drawing attention to all of India. And uh, in India, especially at urban area, it's getting a serious problem about treatment of waste. That is a vast amount of quantity and people cannot find a place to dump that waste. So this kind of technology will be key to resolve problem on the waste management side and scarcity of electricity in expanding the demand of using energy simultaneously. And uh, this one is uh, for enhancing awareness of people. Uh, Kodansha, Japanese famous publisher, expanded their work to India and keep working for the future. Uh, as you may know, this picture shows this is a storytelling for a young child at school, kids or teacher in primary school. The storyteller reads some Japanese picture book which shows Japanese traditional mind called Motainai. Do you know Motainai? This philosophy expresses Japanese habit which is using resources at several times that mind is like, don't litter at once use, don't waste no necessary water, and uh, don't eat too much 
if you cannot eat everything. That is a Montana principle. And uh, recently, uh, all over the world are focusing marine plastic marine plastic litter. Uh, Japan has, uh, uh, you know, a uh, long coastline and a lot of small island. So a uh, vast amount of garbage beach the land and those garbage spoil the beautiful thing around the beach area. Almost of garbage might be plastics and come from uh, adjacent countries such as China, Korea and Southeast Asia countries. The effects of those garbage were critical for marine biodiversity, close ship to ocean, sightseeing visitor and residents nearby coastal area. Uh, that is well known about all around the world. In India, the same happening occurs at beachfront area such as Mumbai and Goa. So according to some studies, Malinita is expanding for all along the world, including North Pole. And the origin is almost the G20 countries. So we, the member of G20, are needed to take action on this matter as soon as possible. So in these circumstances, uh, G20 has held in Japan in 2019, and Japan led the discussion of this, this matter. In this summit, Japan proposed and uh, shared our vision of resolution of marine plastic litter, which called Osaka Blue Ocean Vision. And besides, we agreed on a concrete implementation framework for achieving this vision. Uh, we aim to reduce additional pollution by marine plastic litter to zero by 2050. I think uh, that is surely ambitious vision, but we have to achieve this level of reduction on marine plastic litters. So to achieve this level, we promote a comprehensive life cycle approach through measures such as environmentally sound waste management and the cleanup of marine plastic litter and the deployment of innovation solutions and lastly international cooperation to enhance national capacities and also sharing knowledge is similarly important for eliminating plastic litter on the beach G20 countries to share and update information on relevant policies, plans, and measures, neutralizing opportunities such as the G20 resource efficiency dialogue. And uh, Japan is also supporting international competition and cooperation such as sharing experience and uh, good practice with G20 countries, including India, uh, as well as uh, trying to establish international negotiation committee for combating marine litter in UNIA 5.2 uh, will be held in February 2022 this year, but it might be uh, delayed. So uh, the last part of the of my presentation is a uh, future perspectives relating to India and Japan, as well as the whole world. So I think technology is key to accomplish our goal for sustainable and prosperous world with no one behind, like concept of SDGs. Uh, Japanese companies developed numerous state-of-the-art technologies to improve the environment. Uh, uh, such technologies led to great improvement of the atmosphere environment in Japan. However, we face some burden for using cutting-edge technologies 
Uh, always, there are a lot of gaps between providing companies and the actual end user. User want to expand, expand money more ex effectively, but cutting edge technologies are always more expensive than common ones. So they don't want to use these technologies despite they actually know the advantage of it. I think this case needs interventions from the government side, which will establish some scheme for easy implementation, like giving giving some subsidies, uh, restricting some standards, or establishing market basis mechanism. And one more solution of is the implementation of cutting edge technology to companies is uh, collaboration. Collaboration with various sector will lead companies to wider perspectives, such as getting knowledge of financing scheme from international organizations. Some supporting scheme like JCM, which provides Japanese technology to developing countries with financial and technology support in terms of one of the cooperation for UNFCCC framework and getting uh, investment from the other countries' companies. A Japanese matchmaking facility in environmental fields is later in this slide. Uh, the Japan platform for resilient, uh, redesign sustainable infrastructure, uh, uh, we call JPRSI. Yeah, JPRSI uh, is a is a uh, shares information that is difficult for the JPR, uh, JPRSI members to access and accelerate a developed development process of self-sustained overseas business project for the JPRSI members through making a coordination with relevant parties and uh, offering a business matching opportunity to the JPRSA members, as well as uh, supporting a series of the business phases ranging from project de design according to the needs of the JPRSA members to the development of environmental infrastructure on the ground in effective and uh, efficient manner. Furthermore, the JPRSI offers a total solution to meet the close disciplinary and the complex needs of the partner countries in order for the JPRSI members to formulate the project. Uh, at the same time, one of the collaboration methods is this one, uh, Blue Sky Initiatives, uh, which are special project organized by the Embassy of Japan in India, for mitigating air pollution by ensuring that the best and the latest technology are made available by Japanese company to India. We have been proposing Indian government, including state and the state level government, as well as uh, private sectors in India, for uh, further collaboration with better air policies. Uh, these kinds of collaboration will help in getting unknown support from other countries. A uh, sad key message for you is finance. A uh, roughly calculation of global energy transition investment is uh, $501.3 billion, which has increased 9% from 2019, despite of COVID-19. It means an investor is focusing on the green finance and seeking best partner for working together. As you well know, India is keen to move renewable energy for combating the fast demand of energy consumption, like solar, wind, and biomass. Providing some support scheme, such as PRI, I think 
uh, motor shift and the CCUS uh, later in this uh, slide are the potential areas for reducing GHG emissions. Uh, recently, Prime Minister Modi announced hydrogen emissions. So hydrogen will be a next potential renewable energy and its R&D will be the cooperation area between India and Japan. As you know, Japan has a very much interest for using hydrogen energy for balance sector including uh, combustion of fuel ammonia. Uh, moreover, Japanese big financial banks are well known as one of the most sustainable banks in the world, which provides sustainability linked loan, green bond, or other such kind of uh, financial support among the world. They are eager to give financial support to environmental friendly companies. In such situation, uh, we will shift more green from mass consumption habitat. So Japan would like to cooperate with India uh, to think together and act together about how we can improve the environment in India by using economic relations and utilizing sustainable finance. We are confident of the abilities and the commitment of Indian government and the people to tackle the environmental pollution. And Japan can be great help for India. We hope to work closely with India to improve the environment step by step. This will enable many people to live a healthier and more comfortable life in India. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so Thank much, you so sir, for so those enriching words, words and the way, in which, way in which you explained everything in depth. Japan's transformation is a very motivating model for all the countries of the world. Thank you, sir, for those insightful details. Unfortunately, Yogesh, sir, had to leave due to some prior commitment, but nevertheless, we have Yoshida, sir, for the Q&A round. Our participants from different parts of the world have sent us various questions, but owing to the time limit, we will be addressing only a few. My question to you is, sir, according to you, what can be the setback that a green energy based country can see in the coming five years? So is that question to me? Yes, okay. sir. Oh, yes, yes sir. So, so I think uh, renewable energy is uh, is uh, expanding uh, for the entire world, and uh, the potential area of the uh, renewable energy uh, will be will be uh, emerge from uh, India and China, and also. Uh, Brazil or some other countries uh, because uh, they are expanding the uh, business model and to to more greener uh, like India. So uh, yeah, that that is my perspective. Thank you so much, sir. That was some very enlightful thought uh, by you. Moving ahead to the PowerPoint presentation prepared by our very own students. Our students from different cities and countries have integrated online and worked very hard in curating this amazing video, which I'm sure is a treat for all our viewers to watch. Let's take a glance on the video prepared by our very own students where they have made an attempt to touch upon various components of green economy in a very interesting manner. Over to you, students. We, as Enviro Ambassadors, believe to live in a world which is friendly in every aspect of life, from entertainment to people to employees. So here we have tried a noble effort to enhance your knowledge about the transition to a greener economy and finance, marching towards sustainable livelihood. A green economy is defined as a low carbon, resource efficient and socially inclusive mode of development. In a green economy, growth and employment and income are driven by public and private investment, 
into such economic activities, infrastructure and assets that allow reduced carbon emissions and pollution, enhanced energy and resource efficiency, and prevention of the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services. These green investments need to be enabled and supported through targeted public expenditure, policy reforms and changes in taxation and regulation. UN Environment promotes a development path that understands natural capital as a critical economic asset and a source of public benefits, especially for poor, poor people whose livelihoods depend on natural resources. Mr. Pavan Sukhdev is a scientist by education, international banker by training, and an environmental economist by passion. He is a sustainability thought leader and an influential voice for change amongst business leaders, policy makers, and international institutions. He was the special advisor and head of UNEP's Green Economy Initiative and is currently serving as the founder CEO of Just Advisory, a specialist consulting firm which helps governments and corporations discover, measure, value, and manage the impact on natural and human capital. He was selected as the Personality of the Year by Environmental Finance in the year 2010 and was awarded the 2020 Tyler Prize. Let's now hear Mr. Pavan Sukhdev's views on transition to green economy. Greetings, this is Pavan Sukhdev uh, uh, joining you to talk about uh, transition to a green economy. In fact, which was the topic of uh, a job I held more than 10 years ago as the head of the United Nations Green Economy Initiative. At that time, we produced something known as the Green Economy Report. And we defined the green economy as one which results in improved human well-being and improved social equity, whilst significantly at the same time reducing environmental risks and ecological scarcity. So it was definitely on a win-win design. And frankly, it was the best economic design to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Among the many sectors which required greening or which required doing differently, I would pick two, two key sectors of the green economy, which is sustainable agriculture and renewable energy as being of critical importance for India. Why? Of the 475 million farms, small farms around the world, which are basically less than two hectares, 126 million are in India. And they employ a large part of the 42% of the workforce in India, which is employed in agriculture. The success of the small farm, in other words, whether its yields are increased sustainably, whether its prices for its products are fair prices, and whether there is true resilience in the small farm makes a huge difference between poverty and well-being, between poverty and a decent living for a very large, several hundred million uh, people in India. And that's clearly got to be a focus from the point of view of green economy. It is possible. The example of uh, community managed natural farming in Andhra Pradesh and what they have achieved through the 750,000 farmers who've already begin, begun to transition or completed transition towards sustainable farming is a case in point. When it comes to energy, I would say that in India, the opportunity is absolutely massive. The availability of talent to develop solar, wind, thermal, geothermal, etc is absolutely huge. And of course, we have the sun. Uh, so today, as it happens, only 11% of our energy mix is delivered from hydropower, another 10% delivered from other non-fossil sources. That can increase dramatically and tremendously, and it can give us a huge competitive advantage in the world. The opportunities are in front of us, friends, solving poverty, creating a better world for our future generations, and engaging and embracing a green economy to become the leaders in this in the world. Over to you. All the best. Now let us take a quiet tour of India and find out some interesting work done by a few states and extraordinary individuals creating a valuable impact. The blue box represents state initiatives while the yellow box represents individual works. The initiatives will be discussed shortly. Green economy is a very wide concept. It has many layers. Here are few key components which form an integral part of green economy. Net carbon zero world. 
can simply be defined as the reduction in emission of carbon dioxide. Imagine a world which is pollution free. Sustainability innovation and entrepreneurship can be the driving force to achieve green economy. Green GDP can be elucidated as the nation's GDP with environmental factors. Last but not the least, making a sustainable way of life can be our mantra to conquer our dream of sustainable, ecological, balanced world. The contribution of the aviation industry towards the usage of green energy is attracting attention all over the world. The carbon footprints of the airports can be reduced by opting for renewable sources of energy and thus achieving the goal of net zero carbon world. This goal is being achieved by India's Cochin Airport. Cochin Airport, which is also known as Green Airport, is situated in Kerala. In 2015, Cochin Airport became the first airport in the world to be fully powered by solar energy. This initiative has been cost effective and has also led in the reduction of carbon dioxide. Cochin Airport is also recognized as the first airport in the world to implement solar carport, a parking bay with rooftop solar panels. This initiative is recognized at international level and Cochin Airport has received many awards for the same like Champions of the Earth Prize. In 2018, which is the highest environmental honor instituted by the United Nations. In 2021, the airport has introduced floating solar panels in the airport premises. Floating solar panels are those panels which are mounted on the water body. The Cochin Airport has commissioned one of the biggest solar panels in Kerala, which produces more electricity than what is required for the airport. Kerala. Kerala, like other states, has made large strides in its journey towards a green and clean economy. However, the remarkable thing here is how even the common man has developed an advanced sense of awareness for the environment. On this, we present to you two different cases from Kerala and on how these people have not only embraced the clean lifestyle, but is also propagating the same. Creating a sustainable paradise. Hari and Asha, a couple from Kerala's Kannur district, have been living the near-perfect sustainable lifestyle involving a mud house and a 34-acre lush forest which they grew themselves. The couple say that their dream house not only took less than rupees 4 lakhs to build, it also has all the amenities of a modern house, save a refrigerator and yet uses less than 4 units of power every month. Named Naneva or Moisture, the house was inspired by architect Laurie Baker's cost-effective architecture techniques. Mud was taken from deep inside the earth and solidified using traditional techniques to build the walls of the house. The wood used in the house was taken from trees growing in the forest. None of his floors and roof were created with locally made terracotta tiles and painted with natural clay-based pigments. Staunch practitioners of the Gandhian values of self-sufficient living, Hari and Asha also grew their food in the 34-acre forest. In growing their food too, the couple practiced natural farming with minimum human interference. Moving on to the 7 to 9 Green Store. The 7 to 9 Green Store is one of the first green grocery shopping alternatives to come to India. The founder and owner of the store, Bitu John, got inspiration when he was in London and happened upon a store with a similar concept to the 7 to 9 Green Store. Once he returned back in 2018, he set up the store along the lines of BYOC, bring your own container concept. The main aim of this idea was to reduce the use of plastics, especially the single-use types, which are very harmful for the environment and hard to dispose of as well. Even though the store had a rough start initially when it was set up in Colin Cherry Town, Ernagulam in Kerala, it started becoming renowned due to its novel practices. Soon enough, the store became a model of how green businesses can grow and flourish. Ordained as the abode of Rajas, Rajasthan adorns its majestic forts, wars, deserts, and rich history. Beyond its image as a prime tourist destination and a locale for exotic destination weddings, Rajasthan has evolved as the modern face of India, tapping into its abundant resources. 
Rajasthan has come up with various unique initiatives towards sustainability. Green rating scheme for industries in Rajasthan revolves around the state's aspiration for a better environment, better tomorrow. The program is aimed at enhancing and motivating the environmental performance of companies in Rajasthan. The Plantry Village in Rajasthan is showing the world how it takes a village to save the planet. When the village had daughter passed away, his family planted a tree in her name. It was then the Plantry's leader thought, why not turn this into a wider program? Now, the villages plant an auspicious number for local Hindus to both honor her and to regenerate the environment. Power is among the most critical component for economic growth and welfare of a nation. Rajasthan is emerging as the hub of renewable energy in India. The state has achieved self-reliance in production of power and is an energy surplus state. Furthermore, growing concerns of global warming and climate change requires emphasis on clean and green energy. Rajasthan meets over one third of its energy requirements through renewable energy. With about 325 clear sunny days per year, and the highest solar radiation in the country, the state offers great potential for development of solar energy and its ancillary industries. The state takes immense pride in its solar park situated at Badla in Jodhpur district, which is reportedly one of the world's largest solar parks. The government initiative have been able to attract new investments of more than rupees 1.2 lakh crore in this sector from players such as Greenco and Adhani. Sikkim is known as the land of pristine and mystic beauty. It is India's least populated and cleanest state. So let us know more interesting fact about Sikkim further. Sikkim is blessed with mesmerizing landscape. It officially became part of India in the year 1975. Sikkim is the youngest state of India, yet it has exponentially progressed in sustainability. Sikkim is the pioneer of organic farming in the world. In 2015, it announced the adoption of organic farming. Sikkim government accurately identified the modern problem of agriculture in response to which they officially banned use of pesticides and chemicals in 2013. The result was positive. Farmers were encouraged to use eco-friendly techniques. Even the Sikkim's resort used to promote organic foods grown in their garden. For their excellent work, Sikkim was awarded with an Oscar for Best Policy Promoting Sustainable and Ecological Food System. The detrimental effect of plastic is a known fact. To tackle this, Sikkim came up with the policy to abolish single use of plastic. In government offices, use of packaged drinking was banned in 2016. Materials like stay foam, thermocol disposable plates were also banned as they contribute a large share of plastic waste. We say charity begins at home. Sikkim's Officials abide by this and use reusable water bottles, dispensers, etc. We all should take inspiration from Sikkim and try to change the world for the best. Our institute, Symbiosis, has set many examples of extraordinary people working towards sustainability. Some of them are discussed further. We have Dr. Swati Dixit Ma'am, who was our faculty and head of department of geography. She encourages us to use eco-friendly products. Following are the organizations she has worked with on the path of sustainability. At Jivit Nadi organization, they conducted many workshops for students on toxin-free lifestyle, followed with various projects addressing environmental issues. 
Dr. Swati Ma'am has been associated with Green Hills Group NGO for the last 25 years and by their efforts we are able to witness greenery on the hills. At Ecological Society, various informative lectures were conducted by experts along with projects on riverside habitat, cleanups and rice planting on fields. Jal Meradari organization involved in rejuvenation program of Pune rivers. Apart from these organizations, Dr. Swati Ma'am has also worked with Yashada and Kirloskar Vasundara program. Dr. Swati Ma'am's effort helps to create an inclusive and sustainable world. Mr. Aditya Agarwal is the alumni of Symbiosis School of Economics and has completed his master's in international business from St. Xavier's. Currently, he is the founder and managing director of SA class and global married impacts. He believes in equality and diversity and is extremely passionate about innovation, sustainable energy and climate positive action. He represents CII for SME sustainable practices, pan India and abroad. His company remains firmly committed to United Nations Global Sustainable Development Goals in order to ensure a bright future for our planet. His company has been following sustainable practices like water and electricity conservation, using the resources efficiently and many more in order to protect the environment and thus bring changes. His company has been receiving the best company in green and lean initiatives from Godrej Appliance, St. Cobain and Schindler. His company received the national award for best environment safety on 15th December 2021 in World Environment Seminar. Apart from this, he is also running an NGO named Punk, which he founded in 2013, where they help in women empowerment, skill development, and education for children. Mr. Pankaj Arjun Vadkar is a charter accountant by profession and has also completed his MBA from Symbiosis Center for Management and Human Resource Development. He has been associated with some of the leading firms in consulting such as KPMG, PwC, Accenture Strategy, and Deloitte. He has significant experience in bringing people, process and technology elements in providing meaningful solutions in the areas of finance, supply chain, human resource and operations. He has worked on major technology rollouts as part of transformation projects which include SAP, OpenText, Oracle, MicroStrategy and many more. As his duty towards environment, he has helped in construction of earthquake proof houses in Japan by giving financial support. He is also sporting a digital contract, which is an electronic document used to represent an agreement between partner organizations which are carrying out business. He said that there is a need to replace traditional hangers, which are name stems with e-signatures. It could have a significant impact on push for paperless work and condition of the environment. He is a charismatic leader with wisdom and he has grown up the ranks of the corporate hierarchical structure as he currently serves as the director Strategy, Operations, RP and Cognitive at Deloitte. This is how Symbiosis Legacy creates influential individuals who change the world. Now, a short clip presented by Enviro Ambassadors with some small slogans. Green is the color of change. Green is the color to grow. Green is the color to nurture. Green is the color to Green is the color to sustain. Green is the color to see. Green is the color to rejuvenate. Green is the color to integrate. Green is the color of future.
Thank you, dear students, for making this wonderful video on greener economy. Good afternoon and a warm welcome to one and all. This is Nalini Sapkar and on behalf of Department of Economics and Department of Banking and Finance, I take this privilege to introduce and welcome Mr. Saurabh Lal. Saurabh Lal is a dynamic and versatile personality. He is an entrepreneur and has done his specialization in fundamentals of financial markets markets and MBA in marketing. He has served as an account director at Geometry and Compass during 2008 to 2012. He has designed and implemented integrated experiential marketing campaigns for top global brands across industries like Asian Paints, HSBC, ICICI and so on. He headed planning and executed various signature projects like stand Stardust Awards, launch of both international circuit, etc. He is the founder and business head of Content Culture since 2012. Currently, he is the chief executive officer at Model Com. As far as his special projects are concerned, he has conducted various training sessions for students. He has conducted community program with Red Cross in 2008 in Pune. He was a part of study and cultural exchange program with J.F. Oberlin University, Tokyo in 2008. Now I request Mr. Saurabh Lal to share his views. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the kind words and a very good afternoon to everybody in the audience. Uh, it is an absolute delight and pleasure to come and speak to you all today on a topic which is really progressive. I congratulate uh, Symbiosis College of Arts and Commerce, Department of Economics and Banking uh, for identifying this topic and uh, bringing together people who are uh, purposely driven towards uh, building a more sustainable future. Uh, there are some slides that I would want to show and I'll just share it. <clears throat> I hope the slides are visible to everybody. Yes, it is visible. Great. Uh, of all my corporate experience, uh, I have also been working very closely with the community at the village level. Uh, because while uh, we understand that, uh, you know, business is very important to drive an economy, uh, but greener economy is definitely, and like, you know, uh, I was looking at that very inspiring video which just played before uh, I began talking, uh, where, you know, uh, green has been uh, identified as the color of the future, and very rightly. Uh, I also heard Mr. Yuki Yoshida, uh, where he very uh, categorically brought out, you know, that how uh, all the nations of the world face similar problems, and therefore, it is imperative uh, and it is very important that we come together as nations and you know combat the similar problems uh, together. Uh, and if we can learn from their experience, then why not? Uh, what I specifically am going to focus on today is the role of rural communities in building a green economy. Uh, I firmly believe that green economy will be the outcome of democratization of uh, people participation unless and until we get everybody a part of this uh, green economy will always just remain a concept and it will be very difficult to implement it on ground uh, and why i want to highlight the idea of uh, participating and ensuring that uh, rural heartlands of india and for any country of that matter uh, do get to participate because, uh, uh, and here is a snapshot of what rural India looks like. Uh, we are a nation of uh, upward of 1.3 billion people and 65% of that population still resides in villages in India. Uh, when we're talking about villages in India, we're talking about almost 6 lakhs, uh, 40,000 uh, plus or minus villages across India. Uh, where there are people, there are households, there are families, there are individuals with their dreams. Uh, and it's a sizable population to not keep into consideration, uh, especially when we are trying to bring in a new order to the world. Uh, 
also uh, because we are talking about economy uh, uh, it is very natural that the conversation kind of gets drifted towards economics uh, and even from an economic point of view uh, when you talk about those many number of people we are looking at that and we are talking about a large and huge market opportunity uh, and a market size uh, which you know predominantly uh, currently is being dominated by agriculture fmcg consumer durables and how banking is finding deep roots uh, in the villages of our nation uh, as we talk about what could be the market potential uh, of of the rural population that we are so saying uh, uh, you know the kpmg report suggests that it is 101.69 lakh crores of uh, worth of rural gdp which is already functional uh, now which means that even if we are looking at not creating anything new and we slowly start substituting the same amount of market size consumption with something which is more sustainable a consumption pattern which is greener uh, and which is much more sustainable right from consumption to production uh, and the cycle goes on even just sheer replacement and no addition uh, is is still a huge market opportunity that we are talking about uh i have a very strong belief that the power of economics has the potential to influence behavior uh we have seen it uh, multiple times uh, historically uh we see it uh, in a very small way in our day to day lives that every time there is a money matter involved it has an immediate impact in terms of how do we react to this situation or how it influences our behavior so if towards environment protection if economic if economic activity economic constraints and economic ecosystem uh, can be made a medium for us to reach towards environmental sustainability uh, it is more likely to show results uh, and this is something that i have also witnessed through my close activities with the communities that i do uh, i am also uh, heading a project called model gaon which works towards holistic development of villages and sustaining uh, sus creating sustainable uh, livelihoods especially for women in the villages is something that we're focusing on uh, at the grassroots levels and it is through those uh, experiences uh, those stories that i have experienced uh, those interactions that i have had with people at the village level uh, those discussions that i have had those brainstorming sessions that i have had uh, is has is something you know uh, that experience is something that has helped me come up with a framework of you know how can rural communities actually participate in in building a green economy uh, it, uh you know generally when we talk about an economic ecosystem uh, most of the times we the kind of visuals that come to our minds uh, are are typical around uh, uh, urbanization it is about high end service industries so be it software uh, technology and while those are great things and and definitely uh, big pullers of uh, our society towards a greener economy uh, but when we are talking about majority of people who live in indian villages it is very important how do we make the idea of green economy a very inclusive one and to do that uh, and to ensure that there is mass participation of the rural community in a country like india uh, it is very important to have an ideal Or, or an idea driven uh, framework uh, now this is obviously something uh, which i have tried to put together basis my experience basis my understanding of the rural communities uh, but the idea here is to not give a definite formula but to create a skeleton and uh, you know which at least gives us a canvas to begin the sketch of green economy on uh, especially when we are talking about participation of the rural communities in in uh, uh, you know towards doing this uh, so uh, ironically and uh, not so creatively uh, i have called this framework the green framework uh, and i would like to just take this opportunity to elaborate a little in terms of how do i expand it and how do i see it translating and resulting in uh, the rural communities contributing in uh, building a green economy for us uh, so green uh, g in the green stands for good green uh, this is basically you know uh, we could have uh, called it aspirations as well uh, but aspiration sometimes gets too idealistic uh, and good greed uh, greed in itself uh, 
uh, generally is bad. But when we are talking about good greed, greed is always, uh, uh, you know, it carries that undertone of, of passion, of, of a sense of urgency in terms of wanting to have something. And therefore, good greed is a fairly positive uh, force that will motivate a rural community towards changing their behavior or towards adopting to an ecosystem uh, which is greener, much more sustainable, and therefore much more healthier for them in the long run. Now, what exactly do I mean by that? Uh, you know, typically when we think about a rural community, we, we think about illiteracy, we think about lack of infrastructure, we think about lack of awareness and exposure for people. Uh, aspiration is an outcome of exposure. Only once you realize what the horizon could be, is when you start aspiring to achieve that. However, uh, if there is no exposure in the rural community, the aspirations don't take birth. And therefore, if the benefits of green economy can be exposed as a part of an awareness campaign, as a part of an engagement campaign, which becomes the horizon of the dream that people start catering to or they start dreaming about, uh, then the green economy can actually become a reality. Uh, one of the biggest differentiators of this framework versus whatever is happening otherwise is I believe that, you know, for green economy, we'll have to create a demand first. Uh, generally, all the discussions that happen around uh, green economy are very supply side oriented. So, uh, you know, it could be an organization, it could be a state government, it could be a bunch of individuals who think what should be done uh, to build a green economy. However, uh, a lot of times when you start deploying those methodologies, uh, people are not really ready to accept it. And the reason behind that is because the minds of those people have not been conditioned yet to accept a concept, uh, the accept the new order of green economy. And therefore, there may be a supply of green economy, but there is no demand for green economy yet especially at the heartlands, uh, in any country for that matter, because uh, when people are devoid of basic exposure, the idea of green economy is, is fairly new in itself. And therefore, uh, unless we create a demand for green economy, any supply of green economy will not really land right. And therefore, anybody, any organization, any group of individuals, NGOs, uh, governments, policy think tanks, Whoever gets an opportunity or creates a platform to engage with rural communities, uh, if you can start making people understand what green economy is, why people should have it, and you know, condition people in a manner where they start building a demand for green economy, it will become way more easier to deploy the green economy ecosystem because people would already be in the mood to accept it, adopt it, implement it and evaluate and better it. And that is how any new world order really sustains and evolves. It is when people come together, they accept and acknowledge, they implement it and they keep improving it. Our current economic system was not built overnight and it was the effort of some great minds which went towards one direction. But probably that era of the old economic order is now getting over. However, like I've mentioned earlier, if we are able to produce good greed uh, in people at the grassroots level, which helps people build a demand for green economy, supplying ideas of green economy and supplying methodologies and building an ecosystem for a green economy will become a much faster and effective process, which will yield results in way less amount of time than what is being anticipated right now. So good greed uh, is the first pillar of the framework which I think can be implemented or at least debated upon uh, when it comes to involving rural communities. And, you know, while we are talking about rural communities, some of these ideas are fairly universal. So whether you're talking to an urban audience or a rural audience or, or, or a niche group of people uh, who, you know, who pertain to a certain belief, a certain school of thought, uh, idea being that if you are able to ignite that sense of curiosity in people and make them desire the benefits of green economy and create that demand for green economy, 
the supply would always be readily accepted and widely implemented. Moving on, uh, resilience. So R from green stands for resilience. Indian rural communities are one of the most resilient communities that I have ever come across. Uh, devoid of basic infrastructure, uh, devoid of basic amenities, uh, devoid of a lot of opportunities which could change their lives. Uh, these are communities which are still happy in whatever surroundings that they are in. These are communities which really burn the midnight oil. They work really hard. These are people of integrity and honesty. These are people who really put in their heart and soul in, in building a livelihood for themselves, in trying to create a future for the next generation. It is really heartening to see some heartwarming stories of how families which live in the most challenging conditions have their children who come out and do academically so well. Uh, they do so well in sports, for example. Uh, most of the Olympian medalists that India produced this year, uh, at least half of them have their deep roots uh, connected to villages. Uh, and we know that Indian villages do not really provide great infrastructure for people to build careers upon. And therefore, it is the sense of resilience which really makes them um, uh, people of steel, which really makes them help stand apart. And why is resilience such an important thing for a concept like green economy? Well, green economy is a new order of economy that we all are advocating about. However, change is the toughest thing to implement. For an economic system which has persisted for so long and yielded results for a lot of us, it will be a difficult process to bring about changes in that. It will be a difficult process to change the fundamentals on which our society operates. And therefore, to ensure that the change doesn't get left midway or we do not get fatigued and exhausted uh, by the burden of that change and we drop the idea midway, it is very important to be resilient as people, be resilient as a society and continue to appreciate and understand the importance of having a green economy, continue to appreciate the importance of contributing towards a green economy and therefore, we need to be absolutely resilient. And rural communities, uh, again, I'm talking about not just their scale, but also the psychographics in terms of how well can communities sustain change, how well can they introduce and build upon it. Resilience becomes a very, very important factor. And the Indian rural communities and rural communities, I'm sure for most of our developing nations, are very, very resilient by nature. And therefore, when a community is already used to a certain way of life, which is full of challenges, uh, it becomes easier for them to adapt to something new uh, because they start, uh, that, uh, um, they're starting at a very low benchmark. And therefore, it becomes easier to introduce something new there. So while the people in the rural communities are still understanding the existing and the current economic ecosystem, it will be easier to introduce a new concept of economic order there and make them an integral part of building a green economy. Moving on further to the next part of the framework, equity. So G in green stands for good greed, R stands for resilience, E stands for equity. Now, uh, at this point of time, I would like to just highlight and reiterate the difference between equality and equity. Equality is about providing the same opportunity to everybody and then letting people capitalize and or try and capitalize on that opportunity and do well for themselves. However, in a diverse society like India, equality may just not work. And that is because there is all, already so much of inherent inequality, uh, inherent difference in the kind of backgrounds that we come from, the kind of capabilities that we develop, that an equal opportunity may still not be the best place for some of us to start. However, equity talks about providing a level playing field by 
either building capacity to an individual or adding capability to an individual to first make them equal and then let them have a go at the opportunity that is being presented to them. So when it comes to green economy, again, let us not kind of get distracted by the idea of equality because in a society like India, equity is much more important. And therefore, green economy stands the potential to introduce equity in the society of India. And why do I say that? Green economy talks about sustainable way of life. It talks about sustainable economic activity. And when you talk about sustainable economic activity, like for example, when we talk about the industrial revolution, and we talk about the American economy, which was really to stand uh, the most benefited from that revolution. So whether you talk about uh, the JP Morgans, whether you talk about the Carnegie's, you know, people who really build America, they were able to do that because they could afford the price of admission to develop an economics ecosystem. So, for example, if railroads had to be made, somebody had the money and the resources to get into that business and set up an entire plant, set up an entire chain of uh, manufacturing units, uh, which could really help produce the kind of desired products. And therefore, it means that the price of admission for one person to be able to contribute towards economy building, economic building uh, was way higher. However, when we talk about green economy, we are talking about democratizing the power of building and contributing to your nation's economy. And therefore, equity becomes a very important concept. And again, equity is also very, very relevant to the rural society, especially. You know, India is a nation where every three to five kilometers, cultures change, dialects change, languages change, faiths change, beliefs change. And therefore, the idea of equity could be the common thread which binds the diverse society, the diverse societies of India into one piece. And that would be the economic growth, the economic development, the idea of building the green economy. So like I said, and I would keep uh, reiterating uh, the ideas so that you know we keep connecting one to another. The framework of green suggests that you begin with good green, you do that because we have a society uh, uh, which is full of resilience. Uh, we are talking about equity, uh, which means that everybody has the power to participate in building the green economy. And moving forward, let's next look at the next E and the most important one, which is enterprise. No society or no idea which has the potential to impact the entire society has ever borne fruits without innovation. And enterprise is at the center of innovation. India is a nation of more than a billion people. Uh, India is the youngest nation on the planet with the largest working uh, young population that we have. And it is very difficult to provide jobs. However, if we are able to create job creators versus job seekers, uh, the whole dynamic changes. Now, when we are standing at a, uh, uh, at a time in history of our nation where we have the potential to produce the largest number of entrepreneurs in the world, and these could obviously um, vary in scale, right? So we, uh, we can talk about the smallest of entrepreneurs to somebody who really goes to make, or, uh, you know, make it big, gets a lot of investment, gets it listed on the stock market. There is this entire range, but at the heart of it, we are talking about making entrepreneurs who will create enterprises, which will then generate a lot of employment and then create a lot of economic activity. Now, correcting a wrong path is way more difficult versus ensuring that something new, which is starting, it starts right. Right? It's absolutely common sense. And therefore, for India, uh, we stand at a very important point in history. This is an opportunity that we cannot lose as a nation. 
this is an opportunity that we as a generation cannot lose. And that is that if we are going to produce such a large number of entrepreneurs who are going to be the job makers, who are going to be the people who will drive the economy of our large nation, why can't they be conditioned? Why can't they be made aware? And why can't they be empowered to create enterprises which will contribute towards green economy and not build enterprises which later on in their life cycle will have to eventually come to green economy, which could obviously be much more difficult and tougher for them. And therefore, as an ecosystem stakeholder that it, all of us are, uh, tomorrow a lot of these young students will go on and become entrepreneurs in their own right. It will be absolutely magical if all of us can make each other understand the importance, the significance of green economy, and all the new enterprises that are now coming up and are going to come up in the next few years uh, are kind of designed in a manner where the output that they produce, that entire value chain is green, right? And this is going to be absolutely fantastic. So good greed, resilience, equity, enterprise, and the last pillar of this framework is nation building. End of the day, for a diverse country, for a, for a group of people who are so different from each other, you need something which puts us together. And we, uh, as people, are deeply patriotic. Also, what we are trying to do here at an individual level and maybe at a collective level is eventually going to do some sort of nation building. And when I'm saying nation building, what I'm trying to say is that India has operated in a traditional ecosystem which was given to us uh, by the larger economies, by the more established economies. However, we now stand at a time where we are in the position to build our own economic order. And when green economy offers such fantastic and sustainable outcomes, it is as good as building a new nation, a nation for tomorrow, a nation which has the power to lead the world tomorrow, uh, not just because of our spiritual uh, heritage of the kind of rich history that we have, but because the potential of writing history again in the future by leading the world through the most modern school of thoughts, through the most modern ideas, to the most sustainable ideas, to the most green ideas, is something that we should definitely take this as a nation building exercise. So the framework to include rural communities in specific and any community uh, in general uh, is green. So good greed, resilience, equity, enterprise and nation building. Again, uh, you know, while we talk a lot about green economy, uh, a very big enabler for green economy is going to be green finance. Uh, and, you know, uh, every time I'm the, uh, interacting with the communities, I'm talking to them about, you know, how to build enterprises for them, how to build sustainable livelihoods for them. Uh, and, and obviously, when you're talking about business plans at that level, finance becomes an important part. Uh, and therefore, you know, that, uh, that has also got me thinking about, you know, how can we, uh, what could be the different avenues of bringing in green finance into such enterprises. Uh, and one of the fantastic, uh, and this is just some uh, insight that I'm sharing from the field, uh, one of the fantastic sources of green finance could be the savings that people have. You should really see how people uh, are attached to the post offices in their villages or the nearby villages. Uh, the banks that have opened up there, they take their money very seriously and they really, really are in the habit of saving in whatever they can. The scale of the saving can differ, but they are really, really attuned to saving. Uh, uh, and because that is the kind of mindset that they have been brought up. So, for example, if there could be an institutionalized investment scheme, a saving scheme for the rural community, uh, which if invested or saved in much more greener, uh, investment funds which are uh, regulated by the government and can provide a little additional return on investment, automatically a lot of this money which either remains in people's houses still or is lying idle in the bank can be utilized for economic activity which is green 
and is also beneficial for people at that level. Now, with that additional disposable income, people can are really free to do a lot. They can invest in their own health, healthcare. They can invest in their children's future, their education. They can invest in starting something that you know, an enterprise of their own. There is so much that can be done. And therefore, when you mobilize a community, what I'm trying to say is, when you mobilize a community, uh, it just does not open one window. It opens up doors of opportunity. Because when you start with something with a community, and once the community starts believing in you, once the community understands the benefit of what you are trying to do, suddenly you're brainstorming that problem with multiple brains of that community. And these are people who may not be uh, having the best of academic degrees with them, but these are people who have studied in the school of life. And they have a lot of practical understanding and they have a lot of wisdom. And some of the ideas that can come from them can be really, really path-breaking. And therefore, this community interaction uh, can really be a game changer in terms of how better can a green economy uh, ecosystem be built there. So uh, uh, this is uh, more or less the framework, uh, an idea, a school of thought that I wanted to share with you all young minds uh, uh, with the hope that, you know, whatever I'm experiencing on ground and whatever insights I could have taken out and shared with you, uh, you will apply your minds, you will apply your thoughts and original ideas. And probably, uh, you know, we can co-create uh, an action plan or something which takes the idea of green economy to everybody and, you know, makes makes everybody a part of it. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, I strongly believe that a nation will truly become a green economy only when the ability to build it lies in the hands of all and not just few. Uh, you know, we are talking about, uh, we keep hearing about income inequality and how there is so much of inequity in the world. Uh, and, you know, this is probably an also a great opportunity to eradicate all those evils from our society. Because when we are talking about introducing and installing a new economic world order, uh, it is a fantastic opportunity that we do it in a manner. We lay the foundation in a fashion uh, where it becomes extremely difficult for people to manipulate it and eventually not become holders of wealth, even in the green economy. But it remains much more like a blockchain phenomena where you know everybody is the owner of, of what they're doing and it is not concentrated in, in a few hands. So uh, let's make green economy an idea true and uh, an idea which is uh, something which is implemented in its right spirit and is implemented by all and not just few. Thank you, Mr. Saurabh Lal, for enlightening us on the role of rural communities towards building a greener finance. Owing to the time constraint, we will be taking a few questions. Uh, the first question for you is, what rules of rural communities are limiting our expansion towards the greener finance? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think the biggest challenge for expansion of uh, green economy in rural areas is the sheer lack of understanding. Uh, uh, you know, because uh, economy for for a fairly uneducated section of the society is itself a very complicated topic. And suddenly when you add some color to it and tell them, you know, it's green economy that you're talking about, uh, it gets a little difficult. And therefore, financial literacy, economic literacy in a language that they understand, uh, making them understand the concepts in a fashion that they understand is of utmost importance. Because once they get a hang of it, uh, they will become the flag bearers of the concept at the ground level. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is, uh, in what ways have the rural communities helped the country to uh, enhance the idea of green finance? Right. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, there is a village that uh, I had the opportunity to go where the entire village is uh, involved in natural farming. Now, what that means is there are no chemical fertilizer used uh, in the agriculture practice that they do. There is no insecticide, there is no pesticide, there is nothing. And therefore, 
to make sure that they have the right kind of manure and they have the right kind of uh, natural uh, uh, stimulants for the crop to grow well, uh, they have built their own small handmade plant of sorts, uh, you know, which generates a kind of manure. Now, as a part of these three, four activities, they have closed the loop where nowhere is there any kind of chemical, any kind of insecticide, any kind of non-green technology being used. And at each stage of value addition, there is money being generated. And that finance, that money is now being used in uh, building schools for the, uh, for the children, upgrading health services there locally. So this is a beautiful example of how green money is being generated at the village level, helping them build a village level economy and how that gets circulated. And therefore, circular economy is operating at a micro level in that village, which is helping them build a green economy. Only thing is that they don't know they're doing it. It's a phenomenal thing that they're doing. They don't know what it is. And therefore, like I said earlier, that if you're able to empower them with the concept of the idea, I'm sure it will get spread out like wildfire. Thank you, Mr. Saurablal. It was a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you. On behalf of the Department of Economics and the Department of Banking and Finance of Symbiosis College of Arts and Commerce, I, Ms. Diya Devare, with immense pleasure, welcome you all to the last session of today's webinar on transitions to greener economy and finance, marching towards sustainable livelihood. Today, we have the privilege to have with us an eminent personality, Professor Sebastien Bourdin, who is a professor at the EM Normandy Business School in France and is the Associate Dean of Faculty at the Department of Regional Economics and Sustainable Development. Sir is an affiliate researcher at the French National Center for Scientific Research. He has held academic positions as a visiting professor at University of Massachusetts, Boston, and at the University of Barcelona Regional Quantitative Analysis Group. He holds a PhD in geography from University of Rouen, France. Sir has not only been a PhD supervisor for several research projects and dissertations, but also is a reviewer for uh, various journals. Sir has a high H index of 12, which is an author level metric popularly known as the author's index. Today, he will elaborate on a topic that interests most of us and is relevant in times of increasing environmental consciousness. Without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Dr. Sebastian Bourdin, who will enlighten us on the circular economy as a tool to speed up the green transitions. Bienvenue, Dr. Sebastian Bourdin. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for introducing me. <laughs> um, share my screen. Here. So your voice is a little low, uh, I guess. All right. Can you please increase the volume? Is it is it okay? Do you yes, hear sir, me? Yes, sir. Yes, Now it's fine. Absolutely fine. Thank you, sir. Perfect. So thank you for inviting me uh, at this uh, international webinar. Uh, this is uh, uh, an actual issue, the issue of the transition to a greener economy and finance. And I'm going to talk about the circular economy, which is uh, a, a model, a new model that is uh, in the move now. Uh, first of all, I just would like to come back about the global challenges uh, that has local consequences. First, um, there is an issue concerning the commodity price and the volatility and the depletion of this uh, commodity price. Um, there is also a disruption of the markets and the production patterns, and the COVID-19 has revealed these uh, global challenges. And uh, the most important thing is that uh, there are a lot of problems of pollution and environmental damage linked to uh, the uh, current economy that we are experiencing meaning the linear economy. Uh, this linear economy uh, is based on the use of external resources and most of the territories across the world, the countries, the cities, the regions, and at the local level uh, are dependent uh, from different uh, territories across the world. 
And this dependency today uh, shows that uh, and reveals some problem of geopolitical issues uh, regarding the use of these resources that are uh, non-renewable ones. And uh, this question of the use of resources is a big problem today because it uh, creates competition and inequalities between territories across the world. And as I mentioned before, we see a lot of competition about the resources across the world. Uh, and uh, a competition and inequalities uh, within territories. And we can um, uh, see a lot of examples across the world about uh, the inequalities uh, that are generated by the fact that uh, only a few uh, people in the world are uh, the owners of a lot of resources. So for now, we are in a linear economy, meaning that we have natural resources, we take these natural resources, we make, we, cons we consume, and we uh, then uh, throw the, the, the waste, and it generates a lot of environmental impact. And it is detrimental for the uh, future challenges uh, of the world. So the proposal here is to think differently and to move from a linear economy to a circular economy. And in this circular economy, the idea is to take raw materials once and then design the goods and the services, retail them, consume, collect, and then recycle. And if we are recycling all the uh, uh, goods and services that we are providing and we are consuming, then there is no need anymore to uh, extract, to take raw materials. So this is basically the circular economy. If I uh, can give uh, a definition of the circular economy, I would say that the circular economy is about producing goods and services in a sustainable way by first limiting the consumption and then uh, limiting the waste of resources and the production of waste. So it is all about moving from a throwaway society to a more circular economic uh, model. In the literature, uh, in the academic literature, there are a lot of uh, definition. So this is one of the definition, but there are a lot of definition in the in the literature. And what I would like to uh, show uh, and talk with you is about how the circular economy can boost the economic growth and change the way we are uh, thinking the growth in the world. There are a lot of examples of uh, circular economy model and maybe the, the most famous one is the Kalundburg uh, symbiosis, uh, industrial symbiosis. Uh, Kalundburg is a old fashioned uh, example. The idea is that you have different industries and firms within a territory and you uh, decide to see if the waste of a firm can be a resource for another firm in, within a territory. And in this example, we can see that different firms that were co-located, they, they, they were located uh, very closely, but they were not exchanging anything between them. And uh, once, uh, an elected official decided to say, OK, let's see if maybe one firm can exchange waste uh, and take a waste for another firm to become a resource. And here, the example of Calombo, we can see that uh, some firms, some SMEs, some industries are exchanging either energy or uh, materials or waste 
to develop their uh, economy and their business. And in this example, we can see that there is no need anymore to extract raw materials because we uh, recycle the waste, we exchange resources that can be uh, useful for other uh, firms and SMEs. Another example, which is very well known uh, also, is the question of the biogas. Most of the time, we are uh, creating livestock waste, crops, wastewater, and food waste. Most of the time, uh, this waste remains waste. But in the context of uh, the ecological transition, we can say that let's take all this waste, put it in an aerobic digester, and then with the uh, uh, anaerobic uh, digestion uh, procedure, we can uh, generate biogas, heat, electricity, and we can also use the digestate, that is the weight of the anaerobic uh, digestion, to fertilize, to soil amendments, to livestock bedding. And we can also use the biogas uh, for heat, electricity, but also for biomethane. And like that, some vehicles can uh, function with biomethane, and we can use the biomethane in the gas grid. So here is another example of circular economy. We have waste. We can transform this waste to uh, produce a new resource here, uh, the electricity, the heat, and the biogas. And circular economy generates growth. I'm definitely convinced that it's possible. And uh, for example, uh, here are some uh, uh, data that uh, we have uh, collected with the Ellen MacArthur uh, Foundation. And this data uh, show that we are throwing away 3 million tons of plastics, 50 million tons of electronic waste, and one third of all food produced. If we decide to move from a linear economy, meaning that we don't do anything of the waste, to a circular economy, we offer a 1.5 trillion economic opportunity by avoiding waste, stimulating business growth, and creating job opportunities. Um, the circular economy can be uh, a possibility to develop new business models around the recycle, the reuse, and also to generate new job, new opp opportunities in terms of job for uh, local territories. And again, from an environmental point of view, the idea of using the circular economy is very interesting because you avoid the waste, so you uh, avoid the environmental uh, impact. What we need to implement circular economy within territory, so at the local scale, at the regional scale, in the cities and the region. First, um, I think that when we are talking about circular economy, it's very important to have the local dimension. As I mentioned before with the Kalanburg uh, example of the industrial symbiosis, there is uh, nowadays a need to a territorialization of the production and the need for local anchoring of the economy. The COVID-19 has revealed that we are very dependent from some countries, uh, more specifically China, but not uh, only China, but we are very dependent of some countries. And if uh, a country is experiencing uh, a problem in terms of economic health crisis, this is all the world that is experiencing a problem. So with the circular economy, the idea is to uh, create a new economy that is local and that use all the resources that are produced in a territory to uh, develop a new system, a new economic system. And here, there is clearly a need for territorialization of the production 
and the local anchoring of the economy. Second, if we want to implement the circular economy, uh, it's a question also of territorial eco eco autonomy, sorry. And the question of the territorial autonomy means that you have to uh, think about the supplies and the responsible mobilization of the resources. Third, and for me, it's the most important thing. W most of the people now would like to move from a linear economy to a more sustainable economy. But what is very important in a circular economy model is that we need to get together the stakeholders of a territory, of a city, of a region. Uh, when, we, when I took the example of the Kalonburg, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, before, the, uh, before implementing the industrial uh, symbiosis, there were only uh, firms and SMEs that were collocated, but that were not exchanging anything uh, between them. And when an elected official decided to uh, mobilize the resources, to uh, get together the different actors, to coordinate them, uh, and to, to create a territorial governance. The, uh, uh, the uh, industrial symbiosis uh, was put in place and now it's functioning. So what is very important when you want to uh, implement circular economy is to uh, have a strong coordination between the stakeholders. And most of the time we need uh, uh, intermediaries, intermediaries that can say, OK, you have uh, disposal, you have waste. I we can uh, exchange this waste uh, and create uh, um, a resource for another firm that is collocated and very close to you uh, uh, geographically. So the territorial governance is very important. And uh, another important thing is that we need to innovate. We need new technical uh, innovation. We need uh, R&D, of course, but we also need uh, organizational and institutional uh, innovation. And it is very important now to not think also, uh, only on the uh, technical innovation, but also on the way we are organizing the circular, the linear economy toward the circular economy. So what we need to uh, develop the circular economy, <coughs> first we need uh, firms and SMEs that are uh, engaged in the circular economy. So, for example, we can promote the resource efficiency in the SMEs. Second, we can also stimulate the energy efficiency by promoting the low carbon economy and try to make the waste a resource to produce uh, energy for the future. Another important thing is to think about how we are managing the waste. And a good way to boosting to boost the green growth is to think differently how we are managing the waste. And what, as I mentioned before, another important opportunity to develop a new sustainable uh, economy is to uh, invest in the research and the innovation. And to me, there is not possibility to develop a more sustainable way uh, of developing the growth if we are not investing massively in the research and the innovation. To conclude, uh, the circular economy is based on three principles driven by design. So first, eliminate waste and pollution. Second, circulate products and materials at their highest value. And third, regenerate nature. And if we uh, put in place all these uh, three principles in the linear economy, we can generate economic growth. We can save uh, materials 
uh, raw materials and also have material cost savings. We can uh, generate new jobs, new opportunities. There are a lot of uh, comparative studies across the world that shows that employment impacts of a circular economy transition points to positive employment effects occurring in the case that the circular economy is implemented. And we need to innovate. Uh, the aspiration to replace the linear products by a more circular products is uh, depending on the way we are innovating in the future. So thank you very much. And if you have any question, do not hesitate. Thank you very much, Mr. Sebastian Bode, for your insightful thoughts on how we have moved from a linear economy to a circular economy and how it can be used as a tool to implement within the territories and how it can be sped. I mean, it can be increased uh, for bringing about a green transition. Thank you very much, sir. Merci Buko. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, due to the paucity of time, we'll be just taking a few questions. So the first question that the audience have asked is, what could be the opportunity cost of changing an economy like India into a circular economy? Uh, for me, uh, India is uh, maybe the most advanced, one of the most advanced uh, country that can profit from the uh, circular economy to boost, uh, to boost the way they are, uh, the way you are uh, using the waste and the way you can use differently uh, the waste. I know that, for example, there is uh, EU and India partner for resource efficiency and circular economy that has been implemented a uh, uh, um, few, few months ago. And the idea of, the, of this meeting uh, was to rise global population in an increasingly resource constrained world. Is, it's one of the foremost global challenges we face today. And uh, I know uh, in India that there are some startups that are boosting the circular economy. Uh, and for me, in India, uh, in India, there are a lot of challenges because there, are, there, there is a high demographic growth, runaway urbanization and sustained economic and industrial growth are just come of the many changes India is currently undergoing and that have resulted in a sharp rise in the demand for water and the production of waste. So definitely, circular economy is very challenging for India, but is definitely uh, important if we want to uh, move for a greener uh, India. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that answer. The second question that the participants have asked is, as we are all aware, the Dutch government has set the target for achieving a fully circular economy by 2050. So can we expect any developing countries to come up with similar kind of an initiative? Um, for me, the developing, the developing countries, uh, th there is two possibilities. The first is to, for the developing countries is to say the developed countries uh, has made their economy, has built their economy on a, on a linear one. And why uh, we need to do differently, uh, we need to continue in the linear economy model, it functions, it generates growth, and so on and so forth. And there is a second option, and the second option is we need to do differently that the developed countries to generate growth. And if the developing countries take the second option, they will, they will be the countries uh, of the future. And maybe uh, most of the developed countries will have to learn from the developing countries because if the developing countries are more uh, uh, in, uh, invested in the circular economy, they can uh, be examples for the uh, developed countries. So I'm definitely sure that 
the, the circular economy, the need for uh, tackle the challenges like climate change, biodiversity loss, waste and pollution, uh, it's very important and it's the only way to move uh, to a more sustainable um, uh, economy. Thank you so much, thank Mr. You. Sebastian. Yes, thank you very much for patiently answering all the questions. It was indeed a delight to hear you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, next we move on to the last part of this webinar, which is the vote of thanks. It is said sustainability or greener economy is not a goal to be reached, but a way of thinking, a way of being, a principle that we must be guided by. A very good afternoon to all. I, Dr. Ginny Jacob, on behalf of the Departments of Economics and the Department of Banking and Finance of the Symbiosis College of Arts and Commerce, would like to propose the vote of thanks for the Professor V. M. Dandekar Memorial Series 2021-2022. Today, we were indeed privileged to have amidst us eminent and distinguished personalities from across the globe who have contributed immensely towards the promotion and advancement of environmental and social well-being. Right from the start of this webinar, we have been listening to our esteemed speakers deliberate on a wide array of topics ranging from sustainable development, human well-being, climate change, green finance, green economy, etc. And I'm sure all these talks have been extremely informative, insightful, as well as thought-provoking. To start with, we would like to place and record our sincere thanks and appreciation to our alumni, Chartered Accountant Yogesh Mittal, CFO and Lead Strategy for JBM's Environment Business Projects. Thank you, sir, for sharing your valuable insights on the efforts taken by India as an economy to move towards a greener economy and finance. We would also like to sincerely thank Mr. Yuki Yoshida, Environmental Attaché, serving in the Embassy of Japan, New Delhi, for sharing with us the Japanese experiences in transitioning to a greener economy and green finance, and also on reflecting on what India as an economy could do to improve its atmospheric environment. We are also thankful to Mr. Saurabh Lal, entrepreneur and founder of Content Culture, for highlighting the key role that rural communities contribute towards building a greener finance. Our thanks are due to Mr. Sebastian Borde, Professor E.M. Normandy Business School, Associate Dean of the Faculty, Department of Regional Economics and Sustainable Development France for sharing his rich and vast experiences with us. We would also like to specially thank Lawrence Mariette Sanche, Head of International Recruitment Department, Professor E.M. Normandy Business School for recommending Mr. Sebastian Bourdain for this webinar. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you once again to all the speakers. It was indeed a delight to hear you all. We would also especially like to thank our environmental experts who through their work and actions have created an indelible mark in making our environment more eco-friendly. First, we would like to thank our Indian environmental economist, Mr. Pawan Sukhdev, for his contributions in creating green and sustainable economy. Sir is a sustainability thought leader, an experienced innovator in practice, and an influential voice amongst national environmental policy. We are also immensely proud of the contributions made by a former head of the Department of Geography of the Symbiosis College of Arts and Commerce, our very own Dr. Swati Dixit, who has been involved in various projects related to the attainment of cleaner rivers, greener hills, and making use of eco-friendly products for sustainability. Next, we would like to thank our very own alumni, Mr. Aditya Agarwal, who has started a company which aims at using and conserving resources efficiently, thus making great strides in achieving UN's Sustainable Development Goals. We are also thankful to Mr. Pankaj Arjun Wadkar, who has played an integral part in sustaining and conserving the environment by constructing and developing earthquake-proof houses in Japan by providing all the financial support. We truly admire and appreciate the relentless efforts and contributions 
that they have made towards making our environment cleaner and greener. At this moment, we would especially like to thank our principal, Dr. Rishike Soman, for formally releasing the book, Changing Dynamics of the Indian Economy, the Decade of 2010s and Ahead, an initiative of the Department of Economics and the Department of Banking and Finance. Thank you, sir, for your unstinted support, guidance and motivation. We would also like to thank our vice principal, Dr. Tessie Thadatal, for always being there for us and for providing us with the support to connect with the resource persons for this webinar. We'd also like to thank all our well-wishers and all the distinguished academicians, industry experts and researchers for their contributions to the book, Changing Dynamics of the Indian Economy, the Decade of 2010s and Ahead, a book which has been published in commemoration of the birth centenary of one of the greatest economists of all time, Professor V. M. Dandekar. Special thanks to all the authors who were present today for this international webinar. We'd also like to specially thank Dr. Sunaini Parchare, former head of the economics department and the former vice principal, and Dr. Marcel Samuel, former head of the banking and finance department of the Symbiosis College of Arts and Commerce for conceptualizing and initiating this idea of publishing this book. We'd also like to thank our registrar, Mrs. Gandali Parolekar, Madam, for our continuous support. We are immensely thankful to the dedicated IT support team consisting of Nitin sir and Nazir sir, who have always been there to help us. Thank you, sir, for providing us with all the required technical support and expertise. We would now like to specially thank our greatest assets, our luminous stars of symbiosis, our Enviro ambassadors, Akhilesh, Alita, Ashwini, Ria Reddy, Nikhil, Prachi, Raj, Ria Mahajan, Sahil, Samuel, Siddharth and Sonali. They are our students and they have con contributed immensely. Right from designing the e-brochures and posters to coordinating and connecting with the resource persons and also preparing the videos. Thank you, dear students. You have indeed made us proud. We would like to specially thank all the faculty and students of Symbiosis College of Arts and Commerce, as well as all the other faculty and students who have joined from the different parts of the world. We were indeed awestruck by the overwhelming response that we have received. Thank you very much to each one of you. Your participation and involvement truly encouraged and motivated us. Thank you once again. Thank you to the dedicated and versatile team of the Department of Economics and the Department of Banking and Finance, led by Dr. Sheena Matthews and Professor Dr. Nilofar Raina for their meticulous planning and execution of this webinar. Thank you once again, everyone, for your enthusiastic participation and involvement. I would like to end the vote of thanks with a quote. It is said, sustainable development is the pathway to the future, a framework to generate economic growth achieve social ju justice, exercise environmental stewardship, and strengthen governance. Friends, let us all strive to achieve this endeavor of ours by contributing our best in creating an ecologically inclusive environment by transitioning to a greener economy and finance, and thus march ahead towards attaining balanced and sustainable livelihood. Thank you. Participants, kindly note the link for the feedback form has been posted on the chat box. In order to avail of the participation certificates, you're requested to kindly fill up the feedback form. Thank you. Now I request our students, they have prepared something special for us. So I request them to take over. Good afternoon all. I am Ashwini, a student of third year banking of this college. 
A curious mind often hurt, hunts for opportunities. So, to foster your creativity, Symbiosis College of Arts and Commerce presents Bankonomics 2022. This event is jointly organized by the Department of Banking and Economics. This event will go live from 26 Jan and will be open up to two weeks. You all might be wondering what this event is about. So let me just break the ice for you. This event consists of two competitions. One, a video making competition and the other an e-poster e making competition. Inspired by YouTube shots and Instagram reels for the video making competition, you can gather your friends and make a two minute video in English. This is a platform uh, for, to use your imagination. So come on guys, bring out the influencer in you. If you are a one man army, you would also like to go solo and make up all the videos with your own creativity. If you are coruscating idea to show social and economic impact of COVID-19 on India, the second competition is just the right fit for you. The best way to showcase your all your thoughts in a single place is through an e-poster. So if you're still not convinced, I have a great news for you all. Winners will not only be rewarded with cash prize, but will also get featured on the YouTube channel of our college and the best e-poster will also be posted on the LinkedIn page of our college. So come on guys, let's gear up for this competition. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. We appreciate your participation.